Good evening and welcome to TV 39's Million Dollar Movie. Tonight, George Grizzard, Eli Wallach, and Susan Howard star in Indict and Convict. And now, the Million Dollar Movie. Brought to you by Southwestern Bell Corporation, the one to call on. beyond a reasonable question of a doubt that George Cushing and Norma Belden were shot to death in the early morning hours of Saturday, April the 8th by the defendant, Sam Belden. I'm going to prove to you beyond any doubt whatsoever that Sam Belden could not have committed those murders for the very simple and concrete fact that he was nowhere near his apartment at the time they took place. Had they had sexual intercourse prior to death? Yes. What was the position of the bodies at the time of death? They were in an embrace. In the Belden home, the family occupying the upper floor of the two-family house was asleep. Downstairs, on the floor where Sam Belden and his wife lived, one of the most sensational crimes in Southern California's history was about to take place. the action against the city of Bakersfield for de facto segregation, and Mr. Simmons on the investigation of that municipal court judge for malfeasance in office. Mr. Ferguson on that case that's on appeal. We've got 4,000 cases on appeal. Which one's Ferguson on? Oh, let's see. Never mind. Ask Miss Garrett to come up. Yes, sir.
Fitz. I just got off the phone with Mac Davis from the DA's office. A couple of bodies were found down in Marina del Sol last night. A man and a woman in bed together. They've been dead for two days. Why tell us? Well, because the woman is the wife of Sam Belden, the deputy DA in charge of their local office, and the guy with her wasn't Belden. They think he did it? Well, they're holding him down there, but they don't see how he could have. He says he was in Vegas all weekend. Apparently, his alibi checks out. So where do we come in? Well, Bellin's a big man in the community. Besides being chief prosecutor, the word is he's up for judgeship. Under the circumstances, the DA thinks he better disqualify their office from handling the investigation. If Bellin's going to get a clean bill, they don't want somebody yelling whitewash. He thinks it'd be better coming from the fearless, incorruptible attorney general's office. You wanted to see me? Yeah, just a minute. I'll wait outside. It's all right. It's nothing private. Just a plain old run-of-the-mill love nest double murder. Oh, well, tell me more. Well, that's all I know so far. I guess we're stuck with it. Who shall I put on it? Maybe you better handle it yourself so it won't look like we're brushing it off, huh? Okay. Keep me posted. I'm afraid this one's not for your show, pink ears. <laughs> Male chauvinism. A classic example if I ever saw one. I'll mail you a transcript in a plain brown wrapper. Be sure to address it to occupant. Here. What's all this about? Oh, I took a call from the Hampton Museum in Santa Ana. Somebody donated a painting that's supposed to be a priceless Rembrandt, but some people there are a little doubtful about the authenticity of their masterpiece. They want our crime lab to check it. Well, they take it up on the local level? Well, that's what I asked them. They said they're a public entity and have the right to call in the state for help when they need it. Someone on their board must be a lawyer. Handle it. It was already on the news before I got to the Marina del Sol police station, and I knew that was only the beginning. This case had all the ingredients for page one. Sex, violence, adultery, and a public official involved. I'd handled murder cases before, but when I saw pictures like that, I never got over feeling like a peeping Tom. The official theory was that the shots had come from outside the house, through the open window, by person or persons unknown. Belden was not considered a suspect, and apparently for good reason. We checked out Sam's alibi. Everything fits. Look. Now, here's all the statements. You know, the bodies weren't discovered until Sunday night by a neighbor. But according to the coroner, deaths occurred between 1.30 and 2.30 Saturday morning. 1 o'clock Saturday morning, Sam's wife is seen leaving the yacht club with George Cushing. It's only a few minutes from there to the Belden house. Uh, here's some pictures of the place. It's, uh... It's a two-family affair. Belden has the bottom floor. People upstairs say they heard two gunshots at 2.30 in the morning. Another neighbor lives across the way. Says he saw a light go out at 4 a.m. So the murderer must have spent some time in the place after he shot him. You know, he probably went in to make sure he got Belden. He, he uh, rolled the body off the bed when he was trying to get a good look at him. Girl, that wouldn't take an hour and a half. What was he doing in there the rest of the time? know that. As far as we can tell, nothing was stolen. But the important thing is this. Belden claims that he was driving to Las Vegas Friday night. He says he stopped at a place called Yucca for gas at 3.30 uh, in the morning. The statement's in there from the two gas station attendants backing him up. Now, Yucca's 150 miles from here. It's at least two and a half hours from where Sam lives. That rules Sam out. When did he hear about it? This morning. We put out an APB on him when we couldn't locate him. The sheriff picked him up in Victorville this morning as he was driving home. Look, it's all there. Statements by all the witnesses. Uh, what about the murder weapon? No sign of it. Ballistic says the bullets were fired by a 38 caliber Harrington and Richards defender. Well, anything else I can help you with? No, thanks. I'm just going to sit down and go over this stuff. You seem to have covered everything. Well, there wasn't much to cover. If he wasn't here, he couldn't have done it. Simple as that. Has Belden got a theory? Revenge. Only the killer got the wrong guy. Uh, Mr. Matthews, Sam's a good, tough prosecutor. We like him around here. Hi. How did you make out? You're really interested, aren't you? I'm all ears. Well, come along. As a matter of fact, I want to get your reaction to something. Hey, Fitz, I just got back from Marina del Sol. I'm here by invitation. The local police had already told the press before I got there that they didn't even have cause to get a complaint against Belden. As of now, I agree with them. On the basis of the present evidence, there's no reason to hold him more than 48 hours, so I ordered his release. Where does my reaction come in? 
Belden spent the weekend at a rotary convention in Vegas. And when a sheriff flagged him down Monday morning in Victorville and told him what happened, according to the sheriff's statement, Belden's reaction was, quote, cool, unquote. Well, he was probably in shock. Thing like that? Yeah, but wait a minute. The, the detective who went up to Victorville to bring him back quotes Belden as saying to him, I guess there goes my judgeship. I can't believe that. Unless it was in the back of his mind and it just popped out. No. You know what I think? I think I'd like to know a lot more about Mr. Belden. Watch Channel 11 tonight. He'll be on the 10 o'clock news. Mr. Belden, how do you feel? Do you have any theories as to who committed the crime? I have no idea who would have done such a terrible thing. My best guess is some embittered person I once convicted. She must have broken into my apartment and mistaken George Cushing for me. Do you have any suspects in mind? No, not at the moment. I will say, I can't tell you what it's like to be on the other side of the bars. It's something that every law enforcement officer should experience, and that's, that's all I know. Mr. Do you have any further statements? Well, what do you think? I feel terribly sorry for him. Hello? Oh, yes, Timmy's here. We were just talking about it. What does Muriel think? It, well, tell her I do, too. It, hold on, I'll put him on. Hey, Fitz. Despite our wives, I think we better keep digging. Can you rearrange your schedule to stay on it? Sure, I'm free as a bird. What's a few cases pending before the Supreme Court? We'll take any investigator you want to help you, as many as you need. In case we come up dry, I don't want to be accused of not sending in the first team. Okay, I'll use Mike Bellano. He'd investigate his own grandmother. I take it you and Tim aren't convinced. It wouldn't make any difference if we were. When an officer of the court gets involved in something, we have to lean over backwards. Oh, that must hurt your back. As a matter of fact, I was just thinking my back never felt better. Don't you have to call Mike Bellano? Morning, soon enough. I don't wonder, after all the popcorn you had today. I'll call Mike. Indict and Convict, starring Eli Wallach and George Grizzard. We'll continue in a moment. If our figures match theirs, we might have a deal. Well, let's see what London's got. London, we're ready to receive. Imagine making business calls that are more than just talk. Transmitting Dallas. We've done it. Through the Southwestern Bell Network, you can exchange voice data, even video, over lines you already have, your phone lines. So call on Southwestern Bell for local service and access to your long-distance company and oversee the world from your desk. If you've been injured or disabled and not sure about your rights, Hines, Shahan, and Snyder, attorneys at law, want to help you. We'll work hard to answer any questions and do all we can to make sure all your legal rights have been protected. There's no charge for initial consultation and no fee if settlement is not made. Hines, Shahan, and Snyder want to work for you. Call 526-8600, 526-8600, Hines, Shahan, and Snyder. If you're concerned about your pet's health, please listen to a talk with Betty White. Then I'll be back with a free offer. What love for animals really means is concern for their health and their long life. It's disease you have to worry about. That's why proper nutrition is so critical. I buy Hill Science Diet Pet Foods. They're formulated by veterinarians, experts who know that excesses in sodium and minerals and other nutrients can harm pets. Science diets are properly balanced for each stage of life. Oh, there's nothing I trust more than science diet. Nothing. If you're a concerned pet owner, learn how science diet can help your pet. Call 1-800-452-6300 for free samples of canine or feline science diet. Plus facts on nutrition and why science diet products are sold only through veterinarians and pet food retailers. Call now. Sample science diet. The pet food concern pet owners trust. Did I uh, catch you in the middle of an overdose, Mariah, or what? 
Tuesday night at 8. Tuesday Wells is out of touch I with reality. I wanted to read my mail. Uh-huh. I wouldn't have moved. Give him back the gun and get off the set. Play it as it lays. Tuesday night at 8 on The Source. TV 39. thought this was going to be a routine interrogation. Looks like they're set up for a presidential press conference here. Nothing's routine when DeWitt Foster takes a case. I didn't think he'd come on this strong right off the bat, though. He usually saves that for court. Maybe he figures this will never get to court. Might as well cash in while he can, right? I'm afraid he's going to have to play this one our way. I want to call you think um, just a moment, ladies and gentlemen. Now, you must understand why I cannot allow my client to answer any questions at this time. However, once the official interrogation takes place, I see no reason why it can't be made a part of the public record. Mr. Belden certainly has nothing to hide. I'm sorry, Mr. Foster. I'm afraid I'll have to disagree with you. On what grounds, sir, that my client has nothing to hide? <laughs> <laughs> no, that this interrogation will be open to the press. Well, if my client has no objection, I fail to see why it should be considered obstructive or prejudicial by the state. Certainly we want the public to know as quickly and as thoroughly as possible that he had nothing to do with this terrible tragedy. Oh, I'm sure the public will get all the information it's entitled to, in the usual way. Now, should we go into your office, or do we have to issue a subpoena and have this interrogation downtown? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, but you can see that I'm outnumbered and overpowered. Now, I'm sorry to bring you along on this wild goose chase. The wild goose chase my foot. He got what he wanted out of it. Thank you. Gentlemen. Please be seated, gentlemen. Oh, uh, Sam Belden, Bob Matthews. I need it. And Mr. Bellano, Michael Bellano. Michael Bellano. Yeah, I'm sure you know this by heart, but you also know I'm required by law to inform you of your constitutional rights. You have the right to remain silent. If you give up the right to remain silent, anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. If you so desire and cannot afford one, an attorney will be appointed for you without charge before questioning. Do you understand each of these rights? Yes. Do you wish to give up the right to remain yes, silent? Yes, yes, let's get on. And would you care to tell us in your own words the events of the night of Friday, April the 7th? I was on my way to a Rotary convention in Las Vegas that weekend. Norma, my wife, didn't want to go. She doesn't like conventions. So uh, she made me a couple of sandwiches. I packed my sea bag. That's uh, an idiosyncrasy of mine, sea bag. It's easier to pack. I kissed her goodbye. Have fun. And that was the last time I saw her alive. The car wasn't running too well, so I left it at home and drove my wife's car to the airport. I stopped to buy some cigars and got to the airport at 8.26 to catch the 8.30 flight to Vegas. I'm sorry, sir, but that flight's already left. I can put you on standby for the 9.15 flight. All right. That flight was full. They said I could catch the Western Airlines 11.30 plane. I had a couple of drinks at the bar. All of a sudden, about 11 o'clock, I got tired of waiting. I decided to drive up. I stopped at San Bernardino for some of the eat. Didn't make any more stops, so just outside of Barstow, a little place called Yucca. Got there around 3.30 in the morning. Hey, sir. Fill it up. All the way? Thank you.
gambled for a while at the Desert Inn, then went over and registered at the Stardust for the convention. The first I knew of the murders was when the sheriff stopped me in Victorville on Monday morning as I was driving home. Now, the other man, Cushing, did you know him? I only met him once. I knew my wife was taking flying lessons from him, but I had no reason to suspect that anything else was going on. He uh, apparently had had a few drinks one day before going up, and he buzzed the uh, yacht club. When he landed, he was arrested for drunken flying. Norma called me. I bailed him out of jail. That was the only time I ever saw him. Well, what was your attitude toward him then? Well, I wasn't pleased with him endangering my wife's life. But since they had landed safely. Yeah. The autopsy report showed uh, 0.18 alcohol in your wife's bloodstream. Did she usually drink that much? Norma was a social drinker, and that's all. Obviously, he got her drunk. Mr. Belden, um, were you and your wife on good terms? As far as I knew, we had a normal, happy husband and wife relationship. Sorry, gentlemen, that'll be all. I have to go to my wife's funeral. Just a minute. What, are you going to let him get away with a cheap trick like that? You want Foster to be able to tell those reporters out there we kept a man from going to his own wife's funeral? Despite my best efforts, said Foster, I regret to have to state that Mr. Belden is being badgered by the Attorney General's office, including an abortive effort to prevent him from attending his wife's funeral. Oh, what kind of nonsense is that? It's called establishing a sympathetic climate for your client, and we can expect more of it every time we give him an opening. Opening? What opening? All I said was, wait a minute, when he started to walk out on us. You call that badgering? We're damned if we do, we're damned if we don't. If we go after him, we're bullies. If we treat him gently, we're throwing the case. Nevertheless, it's been dropped in our lap. We can't walk away from it. We've either got to indict and convict Belden if he is guilty or find the so-and-so who did commit the murder. What so-and-so are we talking about? The Belden case. Oh, you mean that poor man you two were badgering? Oh, guess who read this morning's paper? It was on the radio, too. Wasn't that mine? You got any suggestions? What about the murder weapon? They haven't found it. All they know so far from a ballistics check is they were shot with a 38 caliber H&R Defender. How could they tell the make if they didn't find the gun? The striations on the bullet are different. That model's the only one that has six grooves in the barrel instead of the standard five. There aren't many of them around. Postal inspectors used to carry them, but Washington called them all in years ago. We're trying to find out how they disposed of them. Any other suspects? Those ex-cons he mentioned. Now, what about the other man? Was he married? Separated. Separated. Now, sometimes that means I don't want you, but I'm damned if anybody else is going to have you, right? Don't ask me. I'm not even married. Well, since this is a, a case where we don't have any witnesses, purely circumstantial evidence, we're going to have to find someone who has three factors going for him. Motive, opportunity, means. M-O-M, mom. What? That's what we called it when I was in law school. Yeah, we're off to a great start. First he tries to keep a man from going to his wife's funeral, and then he slanders motherhood. Now, if Foster asks you if you believe in Santa Claus, tell him yes. Okay. Now, what's new in the art world? And the crime lab said that outside of three colors that weren't used until over a hundred years after the artist's death, it's a sure enough Rembrandt. You think there's cause for criminal action? Well, I have a couple of things I want to check out before I give you an answer. Okay. Do you think Belden did it? Don't know enough about it yet. Why? Oh, I was thinking. If he's telling the truth, what a shock it must have been to learn that his wife was killed in bed with another man. If it was news to him. Cynic. Norma Belden had made $30,000 a year as a designer. So whatever problem she and her husband might have had, poverty wasn't one of them. Still, somebody had killed her, and we had to check out everybody she had any dealings with, including her boss. Did she have any enemies that you knew of uh, here in the shop? No, no, I can't think of... Well, one person here said something once, also. <laughs> He didn't mean he'd kill her. Who was it? Uh, what did he say? My chief cutter, Irving Bertram. He told one of the girls he'd make $50,000 a year if Norma was out of the way. That was a business comment, a statement of fact. Maybe I exaggerated a little. What I meant was I'd make a lot more money if I had a free hand. 
Are you trying to say that makes me a murderer? Oh, no, sir. We just have to check everything out, you know. Like where you were the night she was killed. Playing poker with four other men. I can give you the names. All truthful men. <laughs> Except when they play poker. <laughs> Naturally, the list of possible suspects included the dead man's widow. But it turned out that Cushing didn't confine his extramarital activities to Norma Belden. There was one other, all right. That's why I kicked him out in the first place. Could you tell me where you were the night of the killings? I was wondering when you were going to ask me that. I was right here with my mother. This other woman. Would you give me her name? This one could handle herself in the clinches. She didn't waste any time getting right to the point of my visit. Look, you trying to see if I've got an alibi or something? No, I'm just talking to everyone who might have a motive. Look, George was supposed to come to my apartment Saturday morning so I could go over his book. I'm a bookkeeper. That's my job. Well, I make extra money on weekends working for other people. I waited for him all morning and he didn't show up. So I went out with a girlfriend. I kept calling all day. He was never there. Ask her. She'll tell you. He had a key to your apartment? Oh, you knew that before you yeah, asked, didn't you? Yes, he had a key. And no, I didn't kill him. How could I? I didn't even know where he was. All right. Thank you. George Grizzard and Susan Howard in Indict and Convict. We'll be right back. Good evening. This is Newsline 39. I'm Karen Hoyer. Dallas voters may not get a chance to decide whether they want a new Citizens Review Board. That's because the Dallas Police Association filed a lawsuit against the city today. The Police Association says the language on the ballot as it stands now is too vague and misleading. The group wants the writing of the proposed change to be clarified by the May 6th election. There will be a hearing tomorrow, and if the issue is not cleared up by Friday, voters may not get to vote on the Citizens Review Board at all. Exxon took out full-page ads in several major newspapers today. It's apologizing for the oil spill that's now spread to the size of Rhode Island. This is off the coast of Alaska in Prince William Sound. Some of the animals are being rescued and washed off. And on some parts of the shore, cleanup crews are actually using cloths to wipe up the oil. Cleanup is expected to take at least six months. Tomorrow, fair and 74. Have a good night. There's nothing more exciting than a fast break. To Pizza Hut for a great supreme deal, where exceptional leaping ability and blazing speed both come into play in pursuit of Pizza Hut's Supreme Pizza, loaded with six mouth-watering toppings. Now get one medium for $8.99, or better yet, two for just $4 more. And that's a deal worth running out for. Pizza Hut's making it great. Don Morgan here, folks, from real hot boot news about the hottest boot sale anywhere in the whole wide world. Just look at these gorgeous snakes. Unheard of, folks, at $1.99. Everything you see is $1.99. You get the belt, the buckle set, everything at $1.99. How about these lizards? We brought those in at $1.99. Unheard of, matching belt set at $1.99. Nobody can undersell the Don Morgan boot people. How about these elephants at $1.69? Unheard of, folks. How about ropers at $59? So get the Don Morgan boots. Dallas, Arlington, Richardson, and now Mesquite. This classic youth bedroom is from Broyhill, and each piece is specially priced now at Haverty's. The twin-size teaster bed is only $1.99. Large hutch bookcase, $1.99. Four-drawer student desk with laminate top, $1.99. Style your room the way you want it. Buy only what you need. Each piece is individually sale priced at Haverty's. Haverty's makes it home fingerprints on glass, smudges on chrome, spots on mirrors. Every day I clean them. Spray on the cleaner, then quick before it drips. Scrub with one paper towel, dry with another. Three messy steps. But now, there's one step glass mix. The new wipe with liquid cleaner built in. You just wipe and leave wet. No paper towels, because glass mix dries by itself to a beautiful shine. No streaks. For your everyday jobs, try new glass mates. It's one step easy. Wednesday night at 8, Rock Hudson is reunited with his long-lost wife. Daddy? Hmm? What do I call your wife? Why don't you just call her mother? Dorian wouldn't mind. I couldn't possibly call her mother. She's not my mother, and she can't take her place ever, even if you did marry her. Susie! Susie! 
I'll see what I can do. Never say goodbye. Right, Wednesday night at 8 on The Source, TV 39. We had six investigators go through the records of every case prosecuted since he's been in office. Only one man ever threatened him. He now lives in Northern California, married with a good job, and three witnesses' words that he never left town that weekend. Now, what about Cushing's wife? I talked to her, also his other girlfriend. Their story's both checked out. No problem with Norma Belden worked either. I guess that leaves Belden. Up to now, we'd been concentrating on who else could have done it. Now it was a different ball game. If Belden was a suspect, we had to go over his alibi with the proverbial fine-tooth comb. Mike and I split it up. I took the gas station at Yucca, which seemed to be very important in Belden's timetable. Are you Norman Hastings? Yeah, that's right. Where's the other boy? Oh, uh, he's off today. You saw my picture in the paper, huh? No, I didn't. Huh. You must not be from around here. It was in the local paper. No, I'm from the Attorney General's office. You're checking out the time it took to get here in the same kind of car, right? Hey, you'd make a pretty good investigator. Yeah, that's what Mr. Belden told me. When did he tell you that? When he came up here yesterday. Him and that private detective. What did they say to you? Well, the detective, Mr. Bennett, he came in the office there and he asked me if I could identify Mr. Belden from a photograph. Then he brought me out here to meet Mr. Belden. Were you able to identify him from a photograph before you saw him? Sure. It's just like I said before. <laughs> Man, you wouldn't believe the action I get around here since this thing happened. Chicks come all the way from Barstow just to talk to me. Yeah. Listen, you told us, Mr. Bennett, that you were sure of the identification and the time before he refreshed your memory. Hey, look, you don't think I'm making this up, do you? Because I told the cops all about it when they came up here right after it happened. You can read what I told them. I have. Well, then. I just wanted to meet you, check out the driving time. Mr. Belden says you're trying to make it look like he did it. No, we're just trying to find out who did. That's our job. Hey, look, I gotta go now. See what I mean? Meanwhile, back at the Yacht Club, as they say in Marina del Sol, Mike was getting filled in on the last hours of Norma Belden and George Cushing. They had arrived there together around 11 the night they were killed and left shortly after 1. Did they have a lot to drink? Uh, yeah, they did pretty good, yeah. Did you ever see them in here before? I mean, together? Me, just the two of them. Yeah. No, I, I couldn't tell you. Mostly they were in and out like the rest of the members, you know. How about Mr. Belden? Uh, was he here much? Well, he used to be. Until after that drunk flying bit. What do you mean? Well, you know, that time that Mr. Cushing got arrested for drunk flying. After that, every time Mr. Belden used to come in, they, people kind of rib him about it. You know, like, uh, where's Amelia Earhart today? <laughs> Stuff like that, you know. But I uh, guess he, he didn't like it because after a while, he kind of quit coming around. Any uh, particular members do the kidding? I don't remember. I, I guess all of them. Like, uh, like the Merry Maids. Who? Oh. <laughs> That's what they call them. The Merry Maids. <laughs> Boy. I don't know where they got that name from. I don't know. Unless, maybe because we like to have a little fun. You know, if you're going to live life, you might as well enjoy it. It's going to be a long time dead. Like Norma. You knew the Beldons well? I was a friend of Norman. Oh, but not her husband, huh? They don't like men who beat their wives. You know, my husband was all his fault. He never did anything like that. Uh, did you ever see Belden beat his wife? Well, I saw her afterward. Huh. It was one night, about ten days before it happened. I can't come in. Sam knows every closet in your house. He'll find me. I don't know where to hide. No, no, no wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, I'll, I'll call Phyllis. No, you come in and watch out the window. Come on. Come on. So I drove over as soon as Sylvia called. Norma was almost hysterical. Did she tell you what had happened? Sure. She told me Sam had beaten her up. She was afraid of him didn't want to stay over at Sylvia's because she thought it was too close. She was afraid he'd come over there looking for her. Did you say what provoked the fight? Huh. Some fight. But there wasn't a mark on him. 
No, no, I mean, why'd he hit her? I didn't ask. I mean, some things are private. Unless she told Marianne. Marianne Bender. I was very close to Norma. She was my best friend. And I really miss her very much. The club isn't the same without her. Did you ever hear about her husband beating her? Oh, this wasn't the first time. You can be sure of that. Once, her ribs were so black and blue, she couldn't even wear a bathing suit. Can you imagine? Did she ever tell you why? Some men don't need a reason. Well, thank you. Goodbye. Bye. We were beginning to get a different fix on what went on behind closed doors in that charming little community by the sea. This is Lieutenant Daniels. He said he'd meet us here. He's the fellow that handled the preliminary investigation. Daniels? This is Mike Volano from our office. Hi. What's his name? Of course, the apartment's been cleaned up some, but everything we took out of here is down at the lab. You can see it any time you want. Well, we figured they had dinner at the table here. Then they went down to the yacht club for a couple of drinks and wound up in the sack. Down this way. What's this door here? Oh, uh, that goes to the same bedroom, but doesn't look like they ever used it. All that junk pile up in front of it. Roy, Barbara ought to see this. One coaster out of place and she has a fit. <laughs> Of course, the cover uh, they were lying on is down at the lab. Now, Sam figures that the guy shot from the open window here. And he uh, came in and he rolled Cushing off the bed. Either that or he rolled off when he was hit. Was this screen off before? I don't know. Could have been the murderer or it could have been a curiosity seeker. People all over the place when I got here. You ever tried a circular bed? <laughs> nope. Me neither. Well, now, you're going to want to talk to the neighbors. The one that heard the shots lives right upstairs, and the guy who saw that light go out, about an hour and a half later, lives across the court there. Okay. Wait a minute. And forget about the guy with the weak kidneys. It doesn't matter what time you saw the light go out. It burned out by itself. Oh, uh, okay, one other thing. One of my men found this in uh, Sam's dresser. When he was uh, searching the room, he didn't think it had anything to do with the case, but... We will live together until May 1st in separate bedrooms but without sexual provocation or invitation. Thereafter, for a one-year trial period, we will cohabit with the understanding that neither one will seek out the companionship of the opposite sex. Until May 1st, each one agrees to inform the other of all unplanned activities in whatever social activities either party should be involved in. Did your man have a search warrant when he took this? No. I, uh, he, was, he was looking for the murder weapon, and he... Puts it under the heading of informative, but inadmissible as evidence. Evidence of what? Now, that doesn't tie anybody into the killing. No, but it sure proves he was lying about his wife. No question, but they were in bed together when they were shot. You can see by the indentations on the bedspread, the depression made by their buttocks, plus a heel mark here, mm -hmm. that they were lying side by side when they were struck. Uh, this is where his head was. Hers was apparently on his shoulder, as there's no indentation on her side. Yeah, it still leaves the question of how his body got off the bed onto the floor. Well, I understood they thought that the killer must have come in and turned him over. Well, that's one theory, but we're trying to figure out how else it might have happened. Did he have rolled off the bed trying to get to the phone to call for help? <laughs> Not with a bullet in his head. How about a, a convulsive action when he was hit? Well, if he'd been hit in the body, maybe. In the head, no. Well, if nobody rolled him off the bed, and if it wasn't a reflex action. It's a phenomenon called lividity. Lividity, yeah. You see, when a human being dies, all the blood in the body soon settles by gravity into the lowest part of the corpse. 
according to the position. Mm -hmm. Now, even though Cushing was found lying on his face, all the blood had congealed in his back, indicating that he was lying on his back when he died. Now, <clears throat> when lividity set in, the weight of the blood concentrating in his back shifted his center of gravity enough to cause him to fall over the edge of the bed and end up lying on his face on the floor. But what about the angle of the bullets? Yeah, well, <clears throat> the first one creased Cushing's forehead and struck her in the head. The second one nicked his left ear and then entered his skull. The upstairs neighbor was sure she heard shots at 2.30 that morning, although at the time she didn't think they were loud enough to be coming from the floor right below. I figured it had to be at least a block or two away. Well, you see, a towel could have muffled the sound. I know, but I just didn't think of it at the time. Are you sure it could have been 1.30? No, not unless my clock's an hour fast, which it isn't. And that's all you heard? Well, at that time, yes. But my daughter said she heard what sounded like an argument going on downstairs. But that was much earlier in the evening. Oh, about, about 11 o'clock. Could she identify the voices? No, just that it sounded like an argument. If the bullets hit Cushing on the left side, the gun couldn't have been fired from the window. The shots had to come from the opposite side of the room, there. The killer had to be in the house. Okay. If the murderer had been in, here in the bedroom, right? And he'd heard them coming down the hall. He'd have gone in the closet like this. No, then the trajectory doesn't match up, does it? No, it's got to be that door. Let me try something. Convict, starring Eli Wallach and George Grizzard. We'll continue in a moment. What if everyone in America lived on one street? You'd have millions of personalities side by side. And if this place existed, Southwestern Bell would have a phone for everyone and every place. From the traditional to the not so traditional. Even phones you dial with your voice. So for your phone, call on Southwestern Bell. Don't be the last on your block. Keep your eye on this. Your mailbox. It's your K-Flex Texas Lottery, and it's back. With nearly a quarter of a million dollars in winners already. So watch this and save your Texas Lottery ticket. Your K-Flex Texas Lottery ticket can pay you big money. Listen to the K-Flex Morning Crew for the first number of the day. We're going to make you rich. I know you've heard this before, but your K-Flex Texas Lottery tickets really are in the mail. Play the Texas Lottery only on 99.5 KPLX. Frank Parra Chevrolet Autoplex. Storms into spring with five days of marathon savings on over 1,000 cars. Trucks. Advance. All prices are drastically reduced and just $49 down delivers. Look, a special purchase of pre-owned 88 GM auction cars. Over 100 to choose from. Like Corsica and Beretta. Take your pick. Each just $74.88. All automatic. All air conditioned. All low mileage. Just $74.88. Extra staff. Extra hours. Profit is sacrificed. We're making deals. Through Tuesday. Only at Frank Parra Chevrolet Geo Mitsubishi Jeep Eagle. Auto accidents? I've seen them all. They arrive, fear and despair on their faces, most not knowing what to do. One attorney, R.A. Gabriel, will send someone to the hospital. He calms their fears, he acts fast, he gets results. I don't normally make recommendations, but call R.A. Gabriel, 748-7979, 748-7979, when you've had an auto accident. You know my patient, Melissa? He actually sent her flowers. I'm talking about I come back to town and people tell me you made a deal with Bugs and Ryan for 85 lousy grand. 85 stinking grand, huh? Thursday night at 8, Rod Steiger is the infamous gangster Al Capone. You not double cross No, I wouldn't. Eh? I wouldn't. Oh, you've had me in jail a dozen times, a dozen times, Shaver, but you've never convicted me. Never, not once. No, because you lied and cheated and bribed and killed your way out. Al Capone, no, Thursday night at 8, on The Source, no, TV 39. No, against him so far is the kind of marriage you wouldn't see in a Disney movie and the fact that he lied about it. 
And he also said he didn't suspect there was anything between Cushing and his wife but flying lessons, right? I got a feeling he was lying about that, too. Matthews, we got a line on an H&R Defender, serial number 02206, used in an attempted robbery of a market in 1965 by one Thomas Baker. Now, guess who the prosecutor was? And guess who signed the receipt for taking the gun and four shells out of evidence as a souvenir? But was it ever test fired? Do they have a ballistics check on it? Report doesn't say. Okay, we'll get right on it. Belden had an H&R Defender, took it out of evidence after a trial six years ago. But was it test fired? Don't know yet. Well, it better have been. I mean, if the guns disappeared and we don't have any ballistics record. Well, it doesn't nail it down, but it's still important. That was a unique gun. There weren't that many of them floating around. Morning. Got anything? Mr. Bennett's in your office. He says you asked him to come in. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bob Matthews. Thanks for coming in. Yeah, Paul Bennett's my name. Yeah. I, uh, I had a feeling you'd want to be seeing me. Yeah, sit down. I know about your trip to Yucca, but that's not what I'm interested in at the moment. I want to know if you've ever worked for Belden before. I'm sure you know we can subpoena your records. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I work for him. Doing what? He uh, hired me to check out his wife's latest boyfriend. Cushing? Yeah. Matthews on three. Thank you. I trust you're calling to tell me you've just concluded your investigation. I'm afraid not. It appears in the light of further investigation that some of the statements your client made in your office could stand a little clarification. I'd like to talk to Belden again. I think it might be helpful to him. I'm afraid I have to turn you down. My client absolutely declines to discuss this matter any further. Does that come from him or from you? <laughs> what difference does it make? The answer is still no. You're sure? Positive. No dice. Where does that leave you? Obviously, Belden thinks it leaves us without enough to get an indictment. You could be right. I'd like to find out. I'd like to take it to the grand jury. You haven't got a very strong case, Bob. The timing of that gas station alibi louses you up. I know. That's why I want to try something that I don't think's ever been done before. Instead of just presenting our side, I want to lay all the cards on the table, call his witnesses as well as ours. Now, you're taking a hell of a chance. If they believe his witnesses, they won't indict. That's why I want to try it. It's a novel approach. I'll say that for him. Go. Are you confident of acquittal? I just come to surprise you. How long do you think the trial is going to last? As a prosecuting attorney of some experience, as I think most of you boys know, I am confident that I will be exonerated when all the facts come to light. It's the other way around. He'll be exonerated if all the facts aren't brought to light. I hope we haven't maneuvered ourselves into a booby trap. If the grand jury believed this, even with Belden's witnesses, they didn't say he was guilty. They just agreed there was enough doubt about the accuracy of his alibi to warrant an indictment. It's a nine-inning ball game. We've just finished our half of the first inning. Foster hasn't even come to bat yet. Yep, let's not kid ourselves. We still have two big fat blanks in your mom, Prince. Ah, but we've got the motive, right? Now, Belden either knew or suspected that his wife was having an affair with Cushing. Now, I'm sure we can nail that one down. Yeah, we better nail down the other two as well before I take it into court. As for means, all we know is that they were killed by a 38 caliber H&R defender and that Belden had once had a gun of that make in his possession. Now, what we don't know, unless we find the gun or the ballistics record on it, is whether or not the murder weapon and the gun he had are one and the same. Okay, so it's a long shot. The Washington's still checking on the disposition of the ones they called in? Okay. Now, that leaves opportunity. We know why he could have done it. We know how he could have done it. But unless we can definitely disprove his timetable, we're dead. And there's no way in the world he could have shot those two people at 2.30 and been in Yucca at 3.30. Now, either the neighbor that heard the shots is wrong about the time or the kids at the gas station are wrong. It's got to be one or the other. There is a third possibility. He just might be innocent. You believe that? No. But that's not what they pay off on. If he is innocent, which I also doubt, then we won't be able to make a case and they won't convict. Right now, I only want to be sure of one thing. If Belden walks out of that court a free man, it'll be because he is innocent. <laughs> a lot of people will still say we threw it. You're not supposed to be that cynical till you're my age. Oh, I was about to congratulate you, but it looks like I've walked in on a wake. 
You don't look at all like ruthless, bloodthirsty prosecutors gloating over an innocent man's tragedy. You're quoting Foster. Old Silvertongue himself. He's just getting warmed up. Incidentally, no go on prosecuting Mr. Rembrandt. Oh? The donor paid $40,000 for the painting, but the bill of sale claims no authentication, so he's got no cause for action. But I think I've opened up a can of worms that ought to be looked into. Okay. Now I know what I love about you. Your poetic use of the English language. <laughs> yep. It's for you, Washington, Post Office Department. Hello? We've got a report on that H&R Defender, serial number 02206. After we replaced that model, we sold them to a wholesaler here. Well, he marketed them to dealers all over the country. According to his records, the one year after was sold in 1961 to Max Tyson, owner of a sporting goods store in Marina del Sol. Wait, now, how do you spell that last name? Okay. Yes, sir, much obliged. This was our first break, we hoped. Along with everything else connected with the case, the gun Belden owned turned out to have quite a colorful history. Then, uh, in 1965, some punk held up my store and took the gun. I got it back in a few weeks. The police department caught him and returned it. But by now, it's a white elephant, and I wish I'd never bought it. Uh, final item, it was sold uh, in February 1965 to a Frank Vernon. Yeah, does that tell you what you need to know? No, not quite. Uh, when the gun was found, it was in the possession of a man named Baker when he was arrested. I have to keep digging. Sorry. Much obliged. Say, listen, uh, when that gun was returned to you by the police in the, uh, after that robbery in 65, did they tell you if it had been used in any other crime? Yeah. Yeah, come to think of it, they said uh, the same punk held up a woman and uh, shot her in the leg, as I recall. Why? Is that important? Oh, you bet your sweet life it is. It was used to commit a felony. Then they must have test fired it. There's got to be a record of a crime somewhere. Maybe it never happened. Maybe the man gave you a bum steer. No, no. He said the police told him the guy shot a girl in a holdup. Now, why would he make up a story like that? We've been through the files for the whole year. If it happened, it'd be there. Unless somebody had it pulled. Wouldn't he have to sign it out? Well, they're supposed to. But what the book says and what some of these young guys do. Would a member of the DA staff be able to come in here by himself? Yeah, sure. All you have to do is flash his ID. They're in and out all the time. gun had been fired from an earlier crime, it would have been smarter to buy a new one that hadn't been. Or maybe he didn't find out about it until after he already signed the gun out. He could have gone into that uh, file room any time. He wasn't even suspended until after he was indicted. There's only one way we can tie the murder weapon to Belden. Boy, if we can't locate those bullets from the test firing, we're in big trouble. If you can't clean up that split, you're going to be in big trouble right here. anybody was watching, but I just made a spare. I'm sorry, Joe. Bob and I were just talking. I know. You know, there must be some men who don't bring the work home with them. We just haven't met them yet. It's that damn gun. You've even got me thinking about it. That sounded just like a gunshot. I don't think you've heard the last three brilliant remarks I've made. I'm sorry. She said I've had something rattling around in the back of my head ever since Barbara said that sounded like a shot. Well, it did, kind of. So do lots of things. Anyway, thanks for a nice evening. Good night. Mm -hmm. Wait a minute. Could I use your bedroom? I've got an idea. I'll bet you have. No, no, I'm serious. I want to try something. If I didn't know you better, I'd say that's the corniest routine I ever heard. But, come on in. Okay. No, 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 you wait here. Just wait and tell me what you hear. Mike, are wait, you... Wait, wait, wait. Listen closely. I'm waiting. Mike! Mike! Oh, what happened? Are you all right? 
What did you hear? What did it sound like? I don't know. Two thumbs, I guess. Could it have sounded like... Like two shots muffled? Yes, I guess so. What the hell is going on? Watch, watch, wait a minute. Okay. You see? That's what that neighbor could have heard when he thought he heard shots at 2.30 in the morning. Cushing's body rolling off onto the floor. Yeah, but would it have been loud enough to wake him up? Well, he was in the bedroom right above him, right? It's quiet that time of night, no traffic noises. I'm gonna call Bob. Even if that's what happened, what does it prove? Well, according to the coroner, they were killed between 1.30 and 2.30. Now, we've been assuming 2.30 on account of that neighbor's uh, statement. Now, if we can move the time up a little, we could show that Belden could have shot them and still had time to get to that gas station and drive down to Las Vegas in the morning. Hello? Hello, Bob? I think I've got something. I just fell off Joanna's bed. I see. Well, fine. We might be able to make it hold up. See you in the morning. Who was that? Mike. Well, what's he doing calling at this hour? He just fell off Joanna's bed. Well, if you don't want to tell me, it's all right. <laughs> George Grizzard and Susan Howard in Indict and Convict will be right back. The house, the lawn, and my thumb are all the same color. Brown. Call True Green, the Southwest's most trusted expert on healthy green lawns. Real people, real problems. My new mother-in-law found a roach in a coffee cup in my house, and I was mortified. I thought I was going to die. She confided in me that she had had a similar problem, and she told me about combat. I had to go out and buy it and try it for myself to see if it really worked. And combat does work, believe me. No roaches, even in my coffee cups. And my mother-in-law knows it. Real combat, the real solution. In today's higher revving and hotter running engines, where is a greater problem than ever before? Oil breakdown can shorten the life of vital engine parts. That's why there's Castrol. Castrol provides maximum protection against viscosity and thermal breakdown. So use Castrol, because driving today can be a grind. Castrol, engineered for today's smaller cars. Jerry, how far do you think you're going to get? I don't have to get far. I've got a car less than two blocks from here. Let's go. Put your hands on your head. Turn around. Let's get out of here. Do it. Robert Urich stars in Vegas, weeknights at 11 on The Source, TV 39. We'll return to tonight's feature presentation after these messages. If you want to catch more big bass like the pros, then you've got to find out how they do it. I'm Ray Scott, and now you can learn the secrets from these full-time Bass Masters by becoming a member of the Bass Angler Sportsman Society. Nationally known pros will teach you their winning strategies and techniques in the pages of Bass Master Magazine, our society's official publication. Ten big issues a year are packed with the best bass and how-to information to help you become a better fisherman. Now, just think about how much you'll learn from the greats like Denny Breyer, Roland Martin, and a host of others. So join Bass today. Call toll-free during this special TV offer, and I'll send you a free gift. Here's how. In addition to 10 big issues of Bassmaster and full membership credentials, you'll get a free tackle pack including Manipulator Worms, Berkeley Trilene Line, Bushwhacker Spinnerbait, a Georgian Shad Lure, and the free book Bass and Magic. To join, call 1-800-367-7400. Send no money. We'll gladly bill you. This message is for everyone hurt by someone else's negligence in an automobile or aviation accident or from a dangerous product. The law offices of Copley and Associates handles bodily injury cases exclusively. In Dallas, call 9. 
in Fort Worth, call 4 for a free consultation and an interview at your home or hospital if you prefer. Call 9 or 4 now. Victims deserve fair compensation. Did I uh, catch you in the middle of an overdose, Mariah, or what? Tuesday night at 8. Tuesday Weld is out of touch I with reality. I to read my mail. Uh-huh. I wouldn't have moved. Give him back the gun and get off the set. Play it as it lays. Tuesday night at 8 on The Source. TV 39. started, we still needed the ballistics record on that gun. But Mike had apparently run into a dead end there. We had no choice but to go with what we had and hope for the best. All rise, please. Department 102 of the Superior Court for the County of Los Angeles is now in session. The Honorable Christine Taylor presiding. Please be seated and come to order. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning, Your Honor. All right. Case number 246513. People versus Belden. Counsel for both sides are present, and the defendant is present. You may proceed, Mr. Matthews. Thank you. Your Honor. Ladies and gentlemen, the state intends to prove beyond a reasonable question of a doubt that George Cushing and Norma Belden was shot to death in the early morning hours of Saturday, April the 8th, by the defendant, Sam Belden. We will base our case upon circumstantial evidence, which has equal standing in the eyes of the law as actual witnesses to a criminal act. The law rightly assumes that if a woman finds a jar of jam half empty and then she finds jam all over her small son's face, that circumstantial evidence is as valid as if she had caught him with his hand in the jar. And we will prove that Sam Belden when he was questioned in his attorney's office, made a number of false statements, and that these false statements evidenced a consciousness of guilt on his part. We will show that Mr. Belden lied about a number of things. He said that his relations with his wife were normal husband and wife relationships, and then he refused to answer any more questions on the subject. We will prove that statement to be false. He also lied about his relationship with Mr. Cushing and his own whereabouts at the time of the murder. While well, Mr. Belden stated that he went directly from the airport by means of various freeways to Las Vegas, there is evidence that he returned to his home in Marina del Sol. We will also show that two days after the killing, on the way back from Victorville to Marina del Sol, the only remorse or concern expressed by Mr. Belden was in the comment, I guess there goes my judgeship. Mr. Belden has been quoted as saying that the murder shots were fired from outside the bedroom through the window at a time when he was en route to Las Vegas. And we will prove that those shots were fired from inside the apartment and by Mr. Belden. We will prove that he had the motive, the means, and the opportunity to do it. And that he did, in fact, commit the premeditated murders of George Cushing and Norma Belden. Hey, I thought you'd be at the trial. I know our side of the case, such as it is. Well, you don't sound very confident. It's Belden beating me to the file in that case that bugs me. Look, if it's so important to the case, why don't you work on the assumption that he didn't beat you to it? Figure out where else it could be. Like where? Like wherever it would be if somebody misfiled it. Is it true that all parking tickets from Los Angeles International Airport are recorded as to time of arrival and departure? Uh, yes, sir. And Mr. Belden has stated that his parking ticket was stamped 826. Will you tell the jury the latest time that any ticket marked 826 arrival was checked out of the parking lot that night? Uh, no ticket marked 826 was checked out after 956 p.m. In other words, nobody arriving at 826 drove out that night after 956 yeah. that that is correct you handle thousands of cars every day at the airport do you yes sir and in your daily record keeping with the thousands of tickets that you have to handle you can state without qualification that no mistake has ever been made no i i couldn't say that oh then you admit that a mistake could be made I walk my dog by their apartment every night just before I go to bed. 
He has a favorite tree. Now, Mrs. Potter, do you remember what time it was that night? The same time, 11 o'clock. We're both creatures of habit. And did you see anything through the living room window of the Belden apartment while your dog was at his favorite tree? Uh, well, I saw parts of three people. What do you mean by parts? Well, I mean, I saw all of Mrs. Belden because she was standing at the entrance to her kitchen and the knees of one man and an arm of the other. Well, let's take the knees first. Uh, the man was sitting. I could just see the knees and uh, the legs of his trousers. Were they uh, large knees or small? Well, that's rather hard to say. They certainly weren't skinny. But what about the arm? That person was standing behind Norma, opening a cupboard door, and all I could see was one arm. A man's arm? Yes. So there were definitely two men there with Mrs. Bell. That's right. Thank you. Do you, uh, generally peer into the Belden apartment while you're waiting for your dog to, uh, relieve himself? Well, it's hard not to see inside when the lights are on. And you know Mr. Belden well enough to identify him by a fleeting look at the lower part of his bare arm? I didn't say it was him. I said it could have been him. Well, it could be any man, couldn't it? Well, yes. Yes, it could be. I was trying to study and it kind of disturbed me. Could you tell what they were saying in the apartment below? No, not really. Only that they were talking kind of loud. Could you tell how many voices there were? It sounded like two men and a woman. Sometimes they talked all at once. You performed the autopsies on Mrs. Belden and Mr. Cushion, did you not, Doctor? <clears throat> That's right. What were your findings? Well, death was caused by uh, <clears throat> gunshot wounds in the head. Had they had sexual intercourse prior to death? Yes. What was the position of the bodies at the time of death? <clears throat> they were in an embrace. Now, directing your attention, Doctor, to this picture taken of Norma Belden. Can you determine from what distance the fatal shot was fired? Oh, yes. <clears throat> As there were no powder burns, the shot was fired from more than a foot away. Now, referring to this sketch of the Belden bedroom, and the places occupied by Cushing and Norma Belden on the bed, were you able to determine where the fatal shots originated? <clears throat> yes, from the door near the closet. Would you point that out on the sketch? Was it possible that the shots came from this window at the opposite side of the room? No, no. Thank you. You resume your seat. Uh, doctor, would you explain the phenomenon of lividity? Oh, well, <clears throat> that refers to the medical fact that the blood settles downward in a body after death. <clears throat> now, how would this have affected Cushing's body? Oh, it settled in his back. Would it change his center of gravity? Oh, yes. Enough to cause his body to roll off the bed? Could have. Now, how long would it take from the time of death before this could happen? Oh, any time after one hour. So that if he had been shot at 1.30, his body could have rolled off the bed at 2.30? It's possible. Thank you. Now, Doctor, you're sure that the bullets had to have been fired from the direction you indicated rather than from the window across the room? <clears throat> yes. Please, if you'll bear with me just a moment, Doctor. <clears throat> now, Doctor, I'd like you to penetrate the heads of these dolls at the same angle as the bullets entered the skulls of Cushing and Mrs. Belden. Thank you. Doctor, this was their position relative to each other. Yes. Now, relative to their position in the bedroom, uh, what direction would you say the heads of the needles would be pointing? <clears throat> They're pointing toward the wall with the closet and the door to the living room. Now, suppose they were like this. In what direction would the head of the needle projecting from the male doll's head be pointing? 
could be in the area of the window. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Lawson. You can't let it drop like that. If I may borrow Mr. Foster's dolls for a moment, please. Now, Doctor, I'd like you to study this carefully. Now, suppose they were lying in this position. In which direction would the point of the needle in the Cushing doll's head be pointing? The ceiling. Now, does this position of the dolls, with the direction of the shots coming from the window, as Mr. Foster suggests, indicate that Mr. Cushing's head was nearer to the window than Mrs. Belden's? <clears throat> yes. Now, would blood spurt immediately from Mr. Cushing's head when he was shot? Oh, in a fraction of a second. And yet, is it not true, Doctor, that no blood was found on the side of the bed near the window, but that blood was found on the side of the bed near the closet and the living room door? That is true. No more questions. Sure, anything's possible. But it sure as hell one long shot that anybody sent the whole file to the crime lab by mistake. I didn't say it was a good bet, it's the only bet. 1965, you say? That's right. You're welcome to look. Might take you a while. Let's go. When you drove Mrs. Belden home that night, did she tell you who was responsible for her bruised and beaten condition? She said Sam did it. Now, Mrs. Dorfman, was one of the activities of the merry maids to cover for each other with an excuse, in the event one was needed, to pacify irate husbands and boyfriends? Objection, Your Honor. We're not concerned here with any other alleged activity. I'm merely trying to indicate the extent of Mrs. Belden's relationship and involvement with this witness. Objection overruled. You may answer the question. The answer is no. That isn't true. Is it a fact, Mrs. Dorfman, that as a merry maid, you requested Mrs. Belden to come to your aid from time to time? No. Norma Belden never asked you to cover for her. Object. The witness has already answered the question. Overruled. Mrs. Dorfman? No. Was the purpose of the merry maid's first drinking? There wasn't any purpose. Did you have a way to determine who was to be the president? No. Wasn't it a fact, Mrs. Dorfman, that the president was the last person engaged in an act of sexual intercourse? Objection. No, that isn't true. But we did have a president. Your Honor, I object to this whole line of questioning. Is irrelevant and improper? I submit that these questions are pertinent to the credibility of the witness. Court will recess for one half hour. I will see counsel in my chambers. Why the sideshow? I'm surprised that such a distinguished member of the bar couldn't find a more appropriate word. I can, but I was too polite to use it. <laughs> Anyone like a soft drink? No, no. Now, I'm going to save my palate for that martini. I hope my wife has ready when I get home. I called the recess because things were getting a little out of hand. Yes, I was just about to move that all questions concerning the merry maids be stricken from the record. They have no possible bearing on the credibility of the witness, but they could injure her reputation. Not as long as her answers continue to be no. The answers may be no, but it's the questions we're going to read in the newspapers and hear on television. I agree. I'm afraid I let it go farther than I should have. I was attempting to prove that the purpose of the group was to engage in such activities. Oh, come on. My questions were never intended to show that Mrs. Dorfman herself engaged in any specific act of impropriety. Striking the testimony now would be like trying to unring a bell. However, I won't allow any more questions of that nature. I better tell my wife to make that martini a double. <laughs> Indict and Convict, starring Eli Wallach and George Grizzard. We'll continue in a moment. Good evening. This is Newsline 39. I'm Karen Hoyer. Dallas fire investigators are trying to figure out whether they missed seeing two bodies on Saturday night. Or is it a matter of two bodies being placed in a burned apartment later? The fire occurred Saturday night in South Dallas and no deaths were reported. But today a man found the bodies of a man and a woman in the burned apartment. Lots of debris covered them. Authorities believe the man was a security guard at the apartment complex. The Justice Department has a study that shows 63% of inmates released from state prisons are 
re-arrested within three years. And they are arrested again for serious crimes. 41% of those ended up back in jail again. And the president of the American Cancer Society admits the group does not pay as much attention to poor people with cancer. More people with average and above income survive five years after diagnosis. Tomorrow, Farron 74. Have a good night. I'm sorry, you just missed her. What if, whenever you left the office... He's not back yet. You could take the office with you. With cellular phone service from Southwestern Bell, you can. In cars all across America, we're keeping business rolling. It's for you. So call on Southwestern Bell and take the office with you. A few words on the Ford Probe GT. But action speaks louder than words. Ford Probe GT. At the Home Depot, we don't just talk about low prices, we guarantee low prices. For example, GE Halogen Flood Light Bulbs, your choice of 75 or 150 watts, are just $6.97 each. And the Intermatic 6 Zoom Floodlight with Timer is a low $59.50 after $5 mail-in rebate. Now these are low prices. In fact, at the Home Depot, we're so confident, we guarantee our prices day in, day out. Home Depot, where low prices are just the beginning. If you've been injured or disabled and not sure about your rights, Hines, Shahan, and Snyder, attorneys at law, want to help you. We'll work hard to answer any questions and do all we can to make sure all your legal rights have been protected. There's no charge for initial consultation and no fee if settlement is not made. Hines, Shahan, and Snyder want to work for you. Call 526-8600, 526-8600, Hines, Shahan, and Snyder. Wednesday night at 8, Rock Hudson is reunited with his long-lost wife. Daddy? Hmm? What do I call your wife? Why don't you just call her mother? Dorian wouldn't mind. I couldn't possibly call her mother. She's not my mother, and she can't take her place ever, even if you did marry her. Susie! <laughs> Susie! I'll see what I can do. Never say goodbye. Right. Wednesday night at 8 on The Source, TV 39. We had almost finished presenting our witnesses, and my guess was that so far we weren't getting any better than a draw. And as Fitz said, the other side hadn't even been to bat yet. Unless Mike struck oil on his rundown on the gun, we were going to be out of business. Time was running out. Ugh, some can of worms, I hope. I just kept my big mouth shut. Hang in there just a couple of hundred more to go. Mm, you say the nicest things. Boy, I'll say one thing about our police department. He sure had a busy year in 1965. I am getting so... Hey. Bingo. Let me see. RB273. Serial number 02206. That's our baby. Let's see. File RB273. Here it is. Okay, let's see. Blah, 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 blah. Ah, when arrested, suspect admitted that he'd stolen the gun from Max Tyson's sporting goods store. We're in business. See the test fire reports on RB273? RB273. Six lands and groups? Yep. Okay. I'll have to take this with me. I'll sign it out, huh? Yeah, okay. I'll call Fitzgerald, will you, while I make this legal? Hello. Did I wake you up? Joanna? 
Of course you woke me up. It's quarter to twelve. Blame Mike. Here he is. Hi, Fitz. I'm at the crime lab. Did you find the gun? No, but I got the next best thing. It was test fired after somebody was shot with it in 1965. We've got ballistics on it. Belden didn't steal the file on it. It was misplaced. Yeah, uh, somebody sent it to the lab by mistake. We found it down in dead files. All right. Get Mel Thomas. Tell him to work all night if he has to. We may want to put him on the stand tomorrow. Will do. Maybe call Bob. No, not yet. Well, no sense waking him. I'll tell him in the morning. Now, you get going on Thomas. Mike Bellano found that ballistics test we've been looking for. I thought you said Joanna when you picked up the phone. Yeah, she's with him. I think it's serious. Of course it's serious. It's the glue we've been looking for to make this case stick. I'm not talking about the case, honey. I mean Joanna and Mike. Oh, I wouldn't know anything about that. I don't understand how you can work with people every single day and you don't even know what's going on between anybody. In the first place, I work with a couple hundred people every day. And when I'm with Mike and Joanna, we're generally talking business. Now, what makes you think there's anything going on between them? Barbara Matthews told me they went bowling with him the other night. That makes a romance? You know, I don't know him very well. What's he like? He's very bright. I know he's bright, or he wouldn't be working for you. Honey, I've got a big day tomorrow. That's what the call was about, new evidence. Well, I hope it'll be nicer than what you did with those dogs. Will you state your occupation, Mr. Thomas? Yes, I'm a criminalist specializing in ballistics, which I've taught in eight colleges through the years. Now, will you identify these two photographs for the jury? I made them myself. The uh, one on the left shows the bullet that was removed from the headboard of the bed after it had pierced Mrs. Belden's skull. The one on the right shows the bullet that was test fired from a gun that was used in the shooting of Miss Jody Corbett in 1965. Mr. Thomas, will you tell the jury the result of your comparison tests on the two bullets, the one that killed Mrs. Belden and the one that was test fired from serial number 02206, the gun Mr. Belden had in his possession? Uh, both bullets came from the same gun. Proving what? Well, there isn't another gun in the world but Sam Belden's that could have killed his wife and uh, her lover. You testified that the bullets that killed Cushing and Norma Belden were fired from a gun that was formerly in Sam Belden's possession. Does your expertise enable you to have an opinion as to who pulled the trigger? Bullets don't reveal this, but they do reveal that they came from the same gun. Sam Belden never denied possessing a 38 caliber gun. What he does deny is that he shot his wife and Mr. Cushing with it or any other gun. All this ballistics testimony indicates is that the murderer, whether he was a former criminal bent on revenge or a burglar or whoever, found the gun and used it on those two people on the bed. Was there ever a defense attorney who didn't promise a surprise witness, huh? Or who didn't tell the press he was confident of victory? He wasn't so tough on cross-examination. Well, can't argue with ballistics or Mel Thomas. So far, his biggest problem's with his own client. Yeah, I wonder why he doesn't tell him to act more like a bereaved husband instead of sitting there popping those damn mints in his mouth. Well, maybe he just can't control him, huh? Despite the fact that the state bears the burden of proof, by which I mean they must prove beyond any reasonable doubt that Sam Belden committed the murders against his wife, and George Cushing in order to justify a verdict of guilty. I'm not going to sit back and merely observe their ineffectual efforts to do so. I'm going to prove to you, beyond any doubt whatsoever, that Sam Belden could not have committed those murders for the very simple and concrete fact that he was nowhere near his apartment at the time they took place. Once you eliminate opportunity from the motive means and opportunity trilogy. The other two, motive and means, become academic and unimportant. Because if he wasn't there, he could not have done it. Um, Mrs. Lansing, will you tell the jury about the event that occurred at the airport on the night of April the 7th? <coughs> uh, Spunky and I, 
That's my son. His nickname's Spunky. Uh, we were having a soft drink at the refreshment stand at the Bonanza Terminal. And at 11 o'clock, I, I said that uh, it was time to leave on account of Spunky. So we went outside. Uh, I was fishing in my purse for my parking ticket when all of a sudden I heard somebody say, look out, son. And I looked up and I saw this man pulling Spunky back from running out into the street. Uh, that was the man. Are you pointing at the defendant, Mr. Belden? Yes. Now, you recognize him as the man that pulled your son out of the street? I certainly do. A spunky could have been run over. And you're sure of the time? Yes, on account of it was time for spunky to go home. Thank you. I'll tell Mike to check on him. Mrs. Lansing, did you arrive at the airport from out of town that night? No, uh, we went there with somebody to watch the planes. Oh, there was somebody else with you when this incident took place? Yes. Yeah. Who was this other person? He said his name was Gordon Harrison. Don't you know? Well, when I found out he was married, I figured he, he probably lied about his name, too. Well, did this gentleman, whatever his name turns out to be, see the incident with your son? I don't know. Uh, I haven't seen him uh, since I found out he was married. I told him not to call anymore. Now, getting back to the gentleman who pulled your son out of the street, what was he wearing? The only thing I notice about strangers when I first meet them are their teeth. Oh, so you recognize Mr. Belden from his smile? Yes. I, I saw his picture in the newspaper and he was smiling. And uh, in the middle of the night, I woke up and... and uh, suddenly remembered what, that I'd seen him before. I called Mr. Foster and told him. Uh -huh. Was it his teeth that caused you to identify him as the man you saw at the airport? Well, at first I didn't think anything about it. I just looked at the picture and threw it aside. In the middle of the night, I woke up and it came to me that it was him. Oh, so it came to you like a vision in the middle of the night. Well... I wouldn't exactly phrase it that way. George Grizzard and Susan Howard in Indict and Convict. We'll be right back. Glasses in about an hour? I thought, sure, as long as the lenses are simple. But I've got a tricky prescription. So I tried lens crafters. Lens crafters craft your quality glasses in about an hour by putting the whole lab right in the store so you can see better and work better in about an hour. Made me a pair of top quality no-line bifocals, and they did it in 51 minutes. No kidding. Lens crafters, custom crafted eyeglasses in about an hour. Seven locations. Call 1-800-522-LENS for one near you. Full is right. Close time. The limited. Close time. Close time. Dillard's. Close time. Close time. Close time. Designer brands at 20 to 50 percent off. Close time. From the Germac Professionals, a brilliant way to care for your silver. Take care of your precious silver with Germac Silver Shampoo and Conditioner. Together, they're better than regular shampoos and conditioners at toning down brassiness and making gray or graying hair gorgeous, shiny, and sterlingly silver. Take care of your silver, then show it off. Now try new silver hairspray. It gives radiant shine and salon hold. Germac Silver, for salon results at home. From Dago Furniture, a design to dazzle and delight the contemporary taste. And it's specially priced now at Haverty's. Sofa $4.99, love seat $4.49. Note how those gleaming brass accents along the graceful flared arms highlight the durable black acrylic fabric. Dare to be different? Well, get this smart looking pair while it's sale priced at Haverty's. Haverty's makes it home. I'm talking about I come back to town and people tell me you made a deal with Belton Ryan for 85 lousy grand. 85 stinking grand, huh? 
Thursday night at 8, Rod Steiger is the infamous gangster Al Capone. You've had me in jail a dozen times, a dozen times, Shaver, but you've never convicted me. Never, not once. No, because you lied and cheated and bribed and killed your way out. Al Capone, Thursday night at 8, on The Source, TV 39. We'll return to tonight's feature presentation after these messages. Ready to see the world with all the comforts of home? Let 4Travel Motorhomes place the world right outside your front window. 4Travel has been selling motorhomes for over 22 years. As a full-service company, whether it's selling you a Southwind RV or a Grand Villa by 4Travel, helping you with your financing and insurance or servicing your RV, 4Travel can help you. Let 4Travel Motorhomes meet or beat any competitor's products or prices today. 4Travel Motorhomes, 276-3673. Look fast, because the hands on this watch are about to disappear. Now, look again. And they're back. Why do these hands disappear? Because they're not really hands at all. They're actually electronic pulses of light. Introducing the amazing laser beam wristwatch. Destined to become a legend in its own time, we believe it will soon be one of the most sought after watches in history. However, as part of a special publicity campaign, we will send you one of these amazing new laser beam luxury watches. Not for the hundreds of dollars you might expect but for only ten dollars but to get your amazing laser beam wristwatch for only ten dollars you must act now if you call within the next thirty minutes you can order a second laser beam watch for only five dollars just half price to order call 1-800-922-6300 that's 1-800-922-6300 fact or fiction car shoppers get better deals in the country it's a fact Chevys do cost less when you buy your new car or truck from Hubbard Chevy Country in Ferris. Hubbard Chevy Country is family owned and operated and prides itself on dependable performance and reliable service after the sale. Plus low overhead allows Hubbard to sell cars and trucks at affordable country prices. Drive out to the most conveniently located Chevy dealership in the Metroplex, Hubbard Chevy Country. Five minutes south of LBJ 635 on I-45 in Ferris. You don't have to wait for your tax refund. Now you can get your money fast. You can? How do I do that? Just go to H&R Block. That's it? That's right, and ask for the Rapid Refund Program. Then what happens? For a small fee, H&R Block electronically files your federal return directly with the IRS, so your refund loan is on its way to you within a matter of days, whether Block prepares your income tax return or not. Yeah, that's fast. That's the new Rapid Refund Program from H&R Block. It's fast. Will you please state your occupation? I'm a bartender at LA International. Ah, uh, were you on duty the night of April the 7th? I was. I asked you to look at the defendant. Did you ever see him before? Yeah. Did you see him on the night of April the 7th? Yeah. Where? At the bar in the airport where I work. I served him some drinks. How many? Mm, three or four. He was there quite a while. How long? I mean, when did he come in and when did he leave? Could you tell us that? I'd say between 8.30 and 11.30. Now, you were employed as a waitress in a tip-top restaurant in San Bernardino that night. Yes, sir. According to the Auto Club map, San Bernardino was 75 miles from Marina del Sol. Now, do you remember a certain customer you served that night? Yes, sir. Could you identify that customer for me? Yes, sir. It's Mr. Belden sitting there. Do you remember what time you uh, waited on him? Well, not exactly. But it was sometime between 12.30 and 2 o'clock in the morning. I remember him because he ordered sausages and wheat toast. On our menu, that's two side orders. It's been established that the gas station in Yucca, where you are employed, is approximately 155 miles from Marina del Sol. Now, in the early morning hours of Saturday, April the 8th, what were you doing uh, prior to the incident in question? I was cleaning the men's room. And while you were cleaning out the men's room, did anyone come in there? Yes. Who? Sam Belden. Do you see him in this courtroom? Yes, I do. Where? He's right there. Now, you're pointing at this gentleman seated at this table. 
Yes. May the record reflect, Your Honor, that he indicated the defendant, Sam Belden. The record may so indicate. And about what time do you place Sam Belden entering that restroom? I'd say between 2.30 and 3.30. Did this man who came into the restroom, was there anything unusual about him? No. Was there anything about his hair that was unusual? No. Anything about his nose? <laughs> no, I didn't notice. About his chin? No. His teeth? <laughs> no. Was there anything about his dress that was unusual or distinctive? No, he was dressed like anybody else, you know, slacks and a sports coat. And he told you he wanted his car filled up with gas, is that right? Yes. Well, there's nothing unusual about that, is there? <laughs> no. Hey, did you have any conversation with him? He said it was cold. Was it cold? Yes. Well, that comment's made from time to time in the early morning hours, isn't it? Usually. So would it be fair to say there was nothing unusual about the conversation you had with this man? No. Do you mean no, it would not be fair to say, or no, there was nothing unusual about it? There was nothing unusual. So there was nothing unusual about either his appearance or the conversation that you had with him, is that correct? Correct. Now, about how many cars come into that station out in Yucca on a Friday night? I'd say about a hundred, sometimes more, sometimes less. So this man that came into the washroom, or the restroom, or whatever it was, he was one of about a hundred or more cars, is that right? Yes. Now, Norman, how do you fix the time that you saw this man in the restroom, and you filled up his tank, and he went on his way? Well, I remember there were these girls that came in to get their car filled, and they asked me what time it was, and I asked Frank, and, and he told me it was 1.45. Well, now, what does this have to do with the man that you saw in the restroom? Because right after that, uh, Frank and I, we sat around for a while and maybe smoked a few cigarettes and, and talked. And then we waited on a few cars that came in. And, and after that, I started cleaning the restrooms. Did uh, Sergeant Enrico of the Marina del Sol Police Department come into your station shortly after the murders and question you? Yes. And isn't it true that you told Sergeant Enrico that there had been some 20 cars after the car with the girls in it? It could be. I, I don't remember. And isn't it true that the car with the girls in it came at 1.15 rather than 1.45? No. No, it was 1.45. May I read page 235, lines 19 through 23 of your testimony before the grand jury? Matthews, you have a vivid recollection of the girls coming in at 1.15 Hastings. Yes, I do. Matthews looking at the clock. 1.15 a.m. Hastings. Yes. You remember being asked those questions that I just read to you? I do, now that you repeat them to me. And isn't it true, Norman, that you cannot give a definite time that you saw this man in the men's room and you serviced his car? No, no, I can give you a definite time. I will read again from your testimony before the grand jury. Matthews, didn't you tell Sergeant Enrico that you were not positive of the time that the Volkswagen was in the service station? Hastings. He wanted a definite time, and I told him I could not give him one. You asked that question, and did you give that answer? Yes. Did you not further testify before the grand jury that the time could have been 15 minutes to a half hour earlier or later than 2.30 to 3.30 a.m.? I guess so. Yes, if that's what it says. That's what it says. While I was emptying the trash at the station, when I noticed Norman was uh, servicing an old VW. What time was that? Uh, 2.30 a.m. Go on. What did you do then? Oh, well, I went over and I started a conversation with the driver. And what did you talk about? Well, see, I have a 65 VW. And I noticed that the seats in his car were torn. You know, sort of ripped at the seams. And I told him mine were, too. And then we talked about how easily they tore. And then he, he drove off. Is it not true that when Sergeant Enrico came by the station a week later and showed you a photo of Mr. Belden, that you did not recognize him? That you suggested that if he came back later, perhaps Norman Hastings could identify the photo? Yes. Now, in connection with the time that the man with the torn upholstery came in, 
Is it not true that you told Sergeant Enrico that you had only vague recollections of the time, that you could not definitely say that it was 2.45 or 3 or perhaps even later? No, I, uh... Yes, sir. When you were waiting to testify before the grand jury, do you remember talking to anyone? Yeah, I talked to several people. Do you recall telling one of the women, Mary Ann Bender, to be exact, I don't know what I'm doing here? I was asleep when Belden was supposed to have been there? Well, she was bugging me, and I just wanted to get her off my back. Thank you. Nice going. I don't like beating up on kids, but I had to. Now, among your qualifications as a criminalist, would I be correct in saying that you established the crime lab presently in use by the Pasadena Police Department? That is correct. Now, you've studied the autopsy and police reports made at the scene of the murders. I have. What were your conclusions? I believe that both bodies were moved by a third party at least two hours after death. And that the third party was probably a woman. Bailiff? Would you kindly explain to the jury how you came to this conclusion? One blood stain in the lower left-hand corner has the characteristics of the heel of a woman's shoe. What is your theory as to how it got there? I believe someone moved Mr. Cushing's body onto the floor and arranged the bedspread over his legs. Bailiff? Thank you. Now, you've performed hundreds of police autopsies, Dr. Rowland, is that correct? Yes. Do you believe that lividity could have caused Cushing's body to roll off the bed onto the floor? I do not. Do you believe that a woman could have rolled such a heavy body off the bed onto the floor? Easily. Would you please show the jury how this could be accomplished? for these demonstrations. <laughs> oh, one more question. Is there any other way for Cushing's body to have fallen to the floor other than being moved there by a third person? Not unless there was a major earthquake. We have to rebut Foster's theory about how Cushing's body got off that bed. Well, Larson's already testified about the lividity factor. That's verbal testimony. We have to be able to show the jury how it could have worked and without anybody twisting any ankles. Yeah, but we got to get the right people, same size. This? Ah, I called your house. Your wife said Tim who? Well, I told her it can't last forever. She offered odds. Well, this ought to take care of Mrs. Lansing's testimony. Had 15 guys check out every page of every newspaper published since she said that business about the beautiful teeth. Not one picture of Belden smiling. Smitty checked out the airport. There are no soft drinks available where she said she and her son got them. So if she saw anybody that night, it was the wrong man and the wrong terminal. How much you weigh, Mike? About 175. Why, am I chunky? Oh, you look just right. Joanna? If she'll do it. If she's the right size, she'll do it. We haven't got time to run a beauty contest. Wait, 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 wait. Do what? You remember when you fell off Joanna's bed? Yeah. You're going to get a chance to do it again tomorrow with a bigger audience. Indict and Convict, starring Eli Wallach and George Grizzard, will continue in a moment. For small businesses like Don, Southwestern Bell Telecom has small business phones. Sager Electric. And as Don's business grows, we'll have equipment that can yes, keep already. right up. And as Don's business keeps growing, we'll have complete communication systems. Sager Electronics. Systems from hundreds of lines to thousands. Mr. Sager, it's London. Hi, Jack. Let me put you on speaker. So call on Southwestern Bell, whether you're getting big or just getting started. Uh, sir, you forgot your umbrella. Fingerprints on glass, smudges on chrome, spots on mirrors. Every day I clean them. Spray on the cleaner, then quick before it drips, scrub with one paper towel, dry with another. Three messy steps. But now, there's one step glass mix. The new wipe with liquid cleaner built in. You just wipe and leave wet. No paper towels, because Glassmates dries by itself to a beautiful shine. No streaks. For your everyday jobs, 
Try new Glassmates. It's one step easy. Frank Parra Chevrolet Autoplex. Storms into spring with five days of marathon savings on over 1,000 cars. Trucks. Advance. All prices are drastically reduced and just $49 down delivers. Look, a special purchase of pre-owned 88 GM auction cars. Over 100 to choose from. Like Corsica and Beretta. Take your pick. Each just $74.88. All automatic. All air conditioned. All low mileage. Just $74.88. Extra staff. Extra hours. Profit is sacrificed. We're making deals. Through Tuesday. Only at Frank Parra Chevrolet Geo Mitsubishi Jeep Eagle. Keep your eye on this, your mailbox. It's your K-Flex Texas Lottery, and it's back with nearly a quarter of a million dollars in winners already. So watch this and save your Texas Lottery ticket. Your K-Flex Texas Lottery ticket can pay you big money. Listen to the K-Flex Morning Crew for the first number of the day. We're going to make you rich. I know you've heard this before, but your K-Flex Texas Lottery tickets really are in the mail. Play the Texas Lottery only on 99.5 KPLX. Did I uh, catch you in the middle of an overdose, Mariah, or what? Tuesday night at 8. Tuesday Weld is out of touch I with reality. I wanted to read my mail. Uh-huh. I wouldn't have moved. Give him back the gun and get off the set. Play it as it lays. Tuesday night at 8 on The Source. TV 39. Let's bring his shoulder in here. Move a little closer, huh? That's it. Now, with the imprints on the bed and the blood stains, they must have been holding each other in this position when the shots were fired from here. Now, Mr. Cushing was shot with the first bullet here. He apparently heard something and turned this way, and that's when he was shot behind the ear. The other bullet went across his head and into the head of Mrs. Belden here. Now at that moment, now remember, she had to be holding him this way in order for the bullet to enter where it did. They both relaxed, rolled over on their backs. Now, lying on his back and after a certain period of time, after the lividity factor has taken its effect, his body loses its stability. Now, I'm going to ask you to try and let yourself go. Just slide off the bed and let's see what happens. Ah, good. Now, you'll take note of the position of the body. Conforms with the sketch where Mr. Cushing's body was found. Uh, well, that's all. Uh, thank you very much. Could the sound of the body hitting the floor account for the two sharp reports that the upstairs neighbor heard at 2.30 a.m.? There's no doubt about it. Uh, the first report was heard when Mr. Cushing's arm hit the door, which the murderer had left open, and Mr. Cushing's arm slammed it shut. The second report was when the body itself fell to the floor. Then the shots were not fired at 2.30 a.m., but considerably earlier. Absolutely. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, at the beginning of this trial, I said I would prove the theory of the people. Sam Belden took his revolver, and he shot his wife, and he shot George Cushing, and he killed them with malice aforethought. At that time, the prosecution could only state that the fatal shots came from a gun of the same make as the gun that he owned. During the course of the trial, we have proved without question that they came from the very same gun. Sam Belden did not know that we'd be able to do that. I think Sam Belden felt safe when he told the police that he had a 38 caliber gun in his apartment because he had no idea, any more than we did then, that there were any test bullets in the sheriff's office or anywhere else that could be used to connect his gun to the killings of Norma and George. And that was his first and possibly only mistake, but it was enough. For if Belden did not shoot them with that gun, who else could have? He stated his belief that someone he once prosecuted is responsible for the murders. But how would any felon, how would anyone in prison know anything about Belden's gun and know where it was and come into that apartment with any kind of thought that maybe he would find a loaded gun? Next, we deal with the question of opportunity. Could Belden have been at home the night that the murders were committed? Now, Belden's alibi hinges on the question of time. 
What time was he here? What time was he someplace else? How long does it take to get from here to someplace else? Now, the first thing a police officer is supposed to do when he makes a report is write down the time. Not look at his watch and think to himself that he'll remember it, but write it down. For instance, you've heard many witnesses in this courtroom. You've been paying close attention, closer than a bartender does to one out of hundreds of customers, or a waitress to one particular customer on a busy night. Now ask yourself, what time did so-and-so get up on that stand? See, the same thing goes for the boys from Yucca. Hey, it depends on what time the murders were committed. If they were committed at 1.30, a 68 Volkswagen could have made it there by 4.15. Now, is that so far off the time they stated? We've heard many witnesses that were supposed to show you that Belden could not have been in his apartment at 11 o'clock that night. But we say that Mrs. Potter walked down that street with her dog, and she looked in, and she saw an arm reaching up into that cupboard. We say that Laura Scanlon heard an argument downstairs in that apartment. We say it was Sam Belden that Mrs. Potter saw, and it was Sam Belden that Laura Scanlon heard. We say that after his wife and Cushing left the apartment and went to the yacht club, Sam Belden got the gun and also left. Now, we don't know what he did between that time and the time they came back and went into that front bedroom together. We do know that when he came back, he had the gun with him. He couldn't have gone poking around the house looking for it while his wife and Cushing were lying together on that bed in an embrace. We say that he came back to the apartment with the gun, went behind the sofa, threw open the door, and fired two shots at them. We say that he had the means, the motive, the opportunity. That he killed those two people. And that he is guilty of murder in the first degree. Now, the judge will instruct you that if, in looking over the circumstantial evidence, it is susceptible of two reasonable interpretations. One which points to innocence and one to guilt. That you must reject that which points to guilt and accept that which points to innocence. Not that you have any option, but that given the choice of two reasonable interpretations, you must accept that which points to innocence. For example, according to the upstairs neighbors, Belden and his wife had some quarrels. All right. Does a man who quarrels with his wife kill her? Yes. Does a man who quarrels with his wife not kill her? Yes, lots of times. All right, the law says that's easy. That you must reject that which points to his guilt and accept that which points to his innocence. Now, if you take all the evidence in this case that is circumstantial evidence and apply this rule your task will be easy. Because there's nothing in the state's case that does not reasonably point to both possibilities. Circumstantial evidence, ladies and gentlemen, is not new. There's uh, the famous case of the bright lad of 17. He became a little overbearing because he was so bright, which annoyed his brothers no end. And not only was he very bright, but his father thought more of him than he thought of any of the other children. And he thought so much of this boy that he bought him a lovely new garment. This, this boy became such an obsession to his brothers that they decided to destroy him, which they plotted to do. But at the last minute, they, they couldn't do it. And instead, they sold him into slavery for $20 or something of the sort. And he was gone away from them. Now, the next thing they had to do was to make the father believe that the boy was gone. Now, before they sold him into slavery, they, they took this uh, fancy garment that they gave the boy. They killed a young goat. They poured blood all over the garment. And they ran to their father in a panic and said, Look, father, look what we found. And the father looked at the garment and said, This is the garment that I gave my son. This, this is his blood. Where is he? And the brother said, we don't know where he is. And the father said, I know what's happened. He's been devoured by a wild animal. And he mourned him for 30 years. Now, I, I can't cite this case as being in one of the volumes of the Supreme Court of the state of California. 
because it happens to be chapter 37 of Genesis of the Old Testament, the story of Jacob and his son Joseph, who was sold from Canaan into slavery into Egypt. So you see, ladies and gentlemen, being misled by circumstantial evidence is nothing new. Today marks the sixth day of deliberation for the jury in the Belden murder trial. This late wire just in, ladies and gentlemen. The jury has informed the bailiff that they have reached a verdict. It was unusual enough for a defendant to make his own plea for sentencing, but Belden had still one more surprise up his sleeve. Instead of asking for leniency, he practically dared them to give him the death penalty. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you no doubt have noticed that Mr. Foster is not present. You need not be concerned. Because Mr. Belden is an attorney, I have agreed that he may represent himself. You may proceed, Mr. Belden. You, ladies and gentlemen, in your wisdom, have decided beyond a reasonable doubt and to a moral certainty that with premeditation and deliberation, I shot and killed George and Norma. Furthermore, by your verdicts and under the court's instructions, you have stated that my guilt of these two crimes is irreconcilable with any other rational conclusion. Now, what does that phrase mean? It means, as I interpret it, that on this evidence, no reasonable person could reach a different conclusion. There are many reasons why a defendant does not choose to take a stand. And there is ample precedent for it. Before the recess, if you recall, I said I might prefer death. Spending the rest of my life in a penitentiary with the nagging thought that they must have had some doubt they would have voted the death penalty. I care not what you think. Believe it or not, there are people out there who don't agree with your verdict. And they're going to think that when it got down to the nitty-gritty, you blinked. That if you had the courage of your convictions, you would have followed through. And if this be construed, as undoubtedly it will, if this be construed as throwing down the gauntlet, and so be it. He even lost his last gamble. That sentence automatically goes directly to the Supreme Court for a review. He figured if he'd won an appeal, he'd be out that much sooner. Yeah, I keep wondering. What would have happened if he'd come right out and admitted that he had done it? Well, if he'd leveled with us, said he'd just taken too much, the uh, outrage of it suddenly got to him, I probably would have agreed to a second-degree plea. He might have been acquitted or had the charge marked down to manslaughter with a minimum sentence, maybe even suspended. His big problem was his ego. He couldn't believe that anybody could beat an old pro like him in court. Well, if he hadn't been unaware of the ballistics report on that gun, and if you hadn't found it, there's a good chance he was right. Well, there's always that one thing. Things have really been piling up lately. The district attorney called to thank you. And four members of the staff called and asked for your extension number. They said they were in court the other day. Well, I've, I've got a lot of work to catch up on. <laughs> yeah, me too. 